This is Amanda. We hired her through a freelancing website and had never met. She's retyping the full manuscript of Roger Morneau's autobiography as its pages were too faded to accurately scan and convert to usable text. His complete story was published in 2015 as the book Charmed by Darkness. What's so relevant about a story that happened two generations ago in a different world, a different culture? After all, Satan isn't real and the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales, right? He was a man of a singular focus, always ready to tell the story of his best friend Cynthia, the unlikely friendship with Roger Morneau, and the supernatural experience that changed them all. The other boys and girls were loud and, and you know, make remarks and so on. But he would sit down and he just watch. And sometimes he'd say something, and when he said something, you thought about it. And that was interesting. And of course, I compared him with the others, and he was far better in every way. I'm driving my rally across the tracks, and of course, not being an expert on the bicycle, my wheel got caught in the track, threw me over, fell flat on my stomach, and I was winded and couldn't get up. And she ran over, grabbed me by the hand, and pulled me off the track. And then she went back and pulled my bike off the track before the train got there and saved me. Another time, I almost drowned in the lake. She saved me again. What happened? I married well, him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the things that he was doing was ridiculous, <laughs> really ridiculous, yeah. I was not an Adventist, but she was. We never argued about what, uh, what to eat, what to drink, you know, or going to church on Sabbath. I decided I'm going to go to church with her because if I didn't go to church with her, somebody else would steal her. <laughs> they married in 1944, both just 18 years old, and began attending church together in this building, the previous home of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Westmont District of Montreal. When the minister said, anybody here like to have Bible studies? And before I could say not me, she said we would. In 1946, Montreal was the center of women's garment manufacturing in Canada, with over 700 factories and more than 19,000 workers. Cyril worked at an embroidery factory as a foreman. A sewing machine operator earned about $20 a week, while a Banaz machine operator, such as Cyril operated, earned twice as much due to the artistic skill required. During this time, labor unions had gained a strong foothold in Montreal. Strikes and riots were becoming front page news. The garment factories were less organized, especially embroidery shops, and the pressure mounted on non-union workers. The union was trying to organize the industry beating up people and make, to make them join the union. I went to the RCMP, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, told them I was afraid of being beaten up and forced into a union, and I got a permit to carry a gun. One day, I opened up my factory, and a big burly fellow came into the place, 
walked down the hall and I saw him coming and I, I knew that was the union. So I took the gun out of my pocket and put it on the counter and said, yes, what can I do for you? And he saw the gun. He said, oh, I just came in and say hello, goodbye. He made a U-turn and went back out. Now I had faith in the gun. And they're off. It's a quick release. Flies out of the box in first. But it's Meanwhile, a French Canadian named Roger Morneau was winning here at the Blue Bonnets racetrack in Montreal. His time with a secret society of demon worshippers was paying off. After professing faith in their great master Lucifer, Roger received the gift of divination. During his dreams at night, he saw the name and number of the winning horses. After several weeks and hundreds of dollars in winnings, the group expected him to be initiated the following week on November 1, 1946. But he had no peace or joy. His parents had warned him about playing with evil and he knew that no one had ever gotten out of that secret society alive. If there's a God in heaven that cares for me, help me. For some reason, Cyril had grown tired of being a foreman and decided to look for a new job that offered more money and fewer hassles. He went to a new embroidery factory nearby and received a job offer with higher pay. Then he said, and if you want to make more money still, you can work Saturday and Sunday. In the meantime, he had a fellow working for him, and I didn't know who this fellow was, but he was Roger Morneau. And he told Roger, Monday we have a new worker coming in, and I want you to sit next to him and find out why he is a Christian and he keeps my Jewish Sabbath. We started working, and his machine would malfunction, as mine did. And as my malfunctioned, I was whistling, and he just kept on working. As his malfunction, he used a couple of cuss words. He was quite prolific. Roger noticed Cyril's calm, peaceful disposition, and became curious about his religious beliefs. And later on, he said to me, Cyril, I want you to invite me to come to your house, and you can tell me what you know. So I said, OK, come this weekend. He said, no, this weekend will be too late. I didn't know at the time that he was a devil worshiper and he had only three days left before he would sell his soul. Cyril had plans for Monday evening, but decided to invite Roger over instead. Oh, that sounds great. Okay. I remembered that I had just bought 28 Bible studies for busy people and I got home as fast as I could and told my wife, I said, Cynthia, we have a fellow that wants Bible studies. You can turn the pages of the Bible while I read the notes. I said, now this fellow wants to come. I said, he cusses like a sailor and he smokes like a chimney. I said, what do you want to do? You know what? Let him cuss and let him smoke. Cynthia was terribly allergic to cigarette smoke. Her symptoms included choking and coughing. Choking, coughing, sneezing, eyes running the whole bit. They both knew she needed a miracle. Cynthia and Cyril lived here on Corsal Street in a district known as Little Burgundy. Roger came to the house. He was on time. See right here, man. Welcome to our home. Thank you. I saw him looking, and he was looking at the corner of the rooms, and he looked like he was looking for something. It was a, a funny feeling about looking at this man. He was... To tell you the truth, he looked evil. All right, all right. You're my first visitor. Do you mind if I take your picture? I wanted his picture because 
he just looked strange to me, more strange than anybody I'd ever seen. Yes, this is pouring water for my friend. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, just trying something. I better pray. This is a weird situation we're in. Each study takes about an hour. Is that too long for you? That's fine. All right, let's pray. How were the scriptures given? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. As we read the questions and looked at the scriptures, he never blinked. I said to Cynthia, I whispered to her afterward, he didn't blink. She said, he must be blinking. I said, maybe he blinked the same time I blinked. <laughs> <laughs> when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of, ye received it not as a word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The sweat was pouring from his face. And I'm saying, well, you know, what's wrong with this man? Question eight reads, what is necessary on our part Psalms 119, verse 11 and 16 reads, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Roger had never studied the Bible before, or owned one. St. Jacques, New Brunswick, Roger's birthplace. His great-great-grandfather, Pierre Plourd, was one of the first settlers here in 1826. Located less than 10 miles north of the U.S. border, Pierre, or Peter, acquired hundreds of acres and land grants from the New Brunswick government, including property bordering the Iroquois River. It was here that he built the first flour mill in the 1840s, near this waterfall. This photo shows the actual mill complex, with the head race channeling water to power the water wheel. Farmers from around the region brought their grain to be ground into flour. The area became known as Moula Morneau, or Morneau Mill, named after Roger's great-grandfather, Pascal Morneau. Roger's ancestors and most of the settlers in this part of Canada were French Catholic. His father, Alfred Morneau, married Clarita Barube, known by their friends as Freddie and Claire. Freddie inherited the mill and raised his family here while supporting his younger siblings, Lucy and Josephine, who became nuns, and Felix, who became a priest. Roger was born in this home on April 18, 1925, and christened two days later on April 20. His parents are noted in the church record along with Freddie's younger brother, Joe, and his wife, Edme as Roger's godparents. This is six-year-old Roger at his grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Roger is standing next to his uncle Felix, the priest, and in front of his father, Freddie. Freddie and Claire raised their eight children to respect God and their church. At the age of 10, Roger studied with other young people and officially joined the Roman Catholic Church on September 11, 1935. After two early brushes with death, Roger began to memorize the catechisms as his mother Claire wanted to prepare him for the priesthood. But he grew frustrated by the teachings on hell and purgatory especially after his mother died. His father was able to pay for 300 masses to be held for her, and Uncle Felix later assured Roger that Claire went straight to heaven, 
avoiding purgatory altogether. Roger was comforted at first, but then remembered a family friend, a godly poor woman, who died and Uncle Felix had said that she was suffering in purgatory. He privately decided that God was a tyrant and walked away from religion as soon as he left home. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. That was a wonderful study. What, what's the next topic? Oh, the next topic is um, the prophecy of Daniel 2. I like it. Let's do it right now. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Daniel chapter 2 presents King Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare which featured a huge multi-metal image from its gold head to its feet mixed with iron and clay. With insights from God, Daniel explains to the king that the statue represents four successive world empires, beginning with the present kingdom of Babylon. History confirms the prophecy. The feet represent fragmented Europe after the fall of Rome in 476 AD. There could never be another political power uniting the old world. Though this hasn't stopped men from trying, and Roger saw personally just how close it came. World War II was less than a year old and Hitler had already seized control of Europe with blinding speed, either by invasion or treaty. Except for one last obstacle, Great Britain. While Nazi planes bombed London and surrounding cities, their submarines, known as U-boats, worked furiously to cripple the Allied convoys, to isolate and starve the UK into submission. From the very beginning, Canada played a key role in what became known as the Battle of the Atlantic by providing Navy ship and air escort for Allied convoys. Everything depended on getting troops, supplies, and weapons to Great Britain through storms, surface raiders, and submarines. The cargo ships were owned by private companies and staffed by civilian sailors in what was known as the Merchant Navy. Roger was one of 12,000 Canadian merchant seamen serving during World War II. This is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. Day For many Canadians, the war was a fight happening far away. The first news <coughs> Until 1942. Hitler's U-boats brought the war to North America. It was known as Operation Drumbeat. The Nazis found the American coastline completely unprepared and undefended. After attacking cargo ships along the U.S. and Canadian coasts, the German U-boats entered the Gulf of St. Lawrence. During 1942, U-boats sank 21 ships, some as close as 200 miles from Quebec City, and killing nearly 300 people, including women and children. In 1942, 17-year-old Roger joined the Canadian Merchant Navy, 
and worked on cargo ships that transported supplies between Montreal and various destinations around the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This is the Walter B. Reynolds. Its port of registry was Montreal, shown here on a contract between the ship owner and the crew. Roger's signature is listed on page six, along with his age, Montreal home address, the previous ship he was on, and the date he signed this agreement, May 9, 1944. On most ships, Roger was engaged as a fireman, whose job was to tend the furnace that powered the steam engine. Even close to home, being a merchant seaman proved to be dangerous. In the end, one out of every eight Canadian merchant seamen lost their lives, a higher death rate than any of the armed forces. Roger learned how the many fulfilled predictions in Daniel, such as the exact time of the first coming of the Messiah and the rise of the Antichrist, gave preachers such as Roy Griffin confidence in the future. God can bring order out of chaos and the entrance of his word giveth light. Late in 1942, people filled auditoriums where he explained from Daniel chapter 2 why Hitler couldn't win the war. According to that prophecy, the only worldwide empire yet to come is an everlasting kingdom set up by God himself. Well, what's the title of the next one? I said, well, we'll do the next one next week. He said, no, 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 do the next one now. I said, the minister told us not to uh, give more than one, one or two a week. I promise. I won't tell your pastor a thing. Let's do it right now. Um, okay, the first question is, does the Bible say positively that Jesus will appear the second time? Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Gave the third Bible study. Beautiful. You know, I like to reward myself for important accomplishments. Do you mind if I light up this cigar? Make yourself at home, Roger. So, what's the next title? I'm not going to tell you. You want four Bible studies in one night. That's... He said, what time do you go to bed? I said, we go to bed maybe 11 o'clock or so. He said, well, it's only 10 o'clock. What would happen if we don't have a study tonight? Is anything going to happen? Honestly, I'm not going to tell you why. It is that I want all the Bible studies tonight. But, but all I can tell you is, if I make it back tomorrow night and get the fifth Bible study, it'll be a super miracle from God. You make it sound like it's a matter of life and death. That's exactly what it is. Beautiful. It was fascinating that he was actually sponging the information that we were giving. After the fourth Bible study was finished, he looked at his watch, he said, you realize, well, it's 11 o'clock, time for you guys to go to bed. It was strange for him to say to me, I'll be here tomorrow night if I'm alive. We had no idea what he meant. Roger was certain that the spirits would kill him that night. For the last few months, he'd been rubbing shoulders with a secret society of spirit worshippers, some of the richest, most powerful men in Montreal. Though he never specified their names or the mansion where they met, an elite culture and extravagant homes similar to what he described really existed. In the early 1900s, 70% of Canada's wealth was controlled by the families living in an area known as the Square Mile. According to Heritage Montreal, the borders ranged from Park to Guy and from Pine along the slopes of Mount Royal 
down to René Lebec. Some entertain royalty, judges, generals, and bishops, and through parties of up to a thousand invited guests. Some had art galleries, rarely surpassed, even in Europe. By the 1950s, mansions were being torn down to make way for retailers, office towers, and apartment buildings. Today, only a small portion remain. The secret society met weekly for praise sessions to the spirits, whom they referred to as the gods. Roger heard them tell how their gifts of clairvoyance and telepathy influenced business deals. And a physician spoke of how his hypnotic and healing powers stopped pain and severe wounds from bleeding. In Europe, a man was demonstrating a similar gift, being stabbed through his body repeatedly, yet without harm or loss of blood. His mission? to promote the reality of a higher power and world peace. In 1948, he died soon after his so-called guardian angel directed him to swallow a needle. The worship room included large paintings of Satan and his generals, who'd materialized in human form, wearing clothing from different eras and cultures. Roger's description is strikingly similar to portraits like these that emerged out of Theosophy, the teachings of Helena Blavatsky, based on her interactions with highly evolved human beings, whom she referred to as Mahatmas, allegedly gods in the afterlife who now live to benefit mankind and can manifest as spirit or in physical bodies. In the 1930s, well-known artist Charles Sindelar claimed that a Mahatma calling himself Saint Germain visited his studio and posed for this portrait. During this time, famous Brazilian medium Chico Javier was channeling books from a spirit guide calling himself Emmanuel. This artist's rendering, affirmed by Chico as an accurate representation, looks remarkably similar to Roger's description of the painting of Satan in the Montreal worship room. Satan was affectionately referred to as God with us, which is the meaning of the Hebrew word Emmanuel, a biblical name referring to Jesus Christ. The Montreal group believed that Satan and his angels are real, that they fell from heaven, that Satan deceived our first parents and became the god of this world. They believed that the dead are really dead and that, like the Creator, Satan is a life giver who someday will resurrect his own to reign with him on this planet. They believed he was misunderstood and his best defense was promoting the belief that he doesn't exist, giving fallen angels even more freedom to masquerade as spirits of the dead. This all confused Roger as he'd been raised to believe that humans do have an immortal soul, and recently he'd been communicating with what he thought was the spirit of his dead mother. Roger wondered why he was still alive. Surely God doesn't forgive demon worshippers. Then again, he shouldn't have survived the war either.
After the invasion at Normandy, the Allies encountered fierce opposition, often from Nazi panzer units. Within weeks, the Canadian Army suffered thousands of casualties. Reinforcements were needed. Well docked at port, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police boarded the Walter B. Reynolds and presented Roger with a draft notice. On the ship's contract, call to Army is noted as the reason for his discharge, but active merchant Navy seamen were exempt from the draft. Due to a clerical error, Roger's name was excluded from the most recent union report to the Canadian government. Two days later, on July 22, 1944, Roger joined the Canadian Army. He was stationed at Camp Borden, where he completed basic and advanced training. On November 24, the Canadian government approved an immediate dispatch of 10,000 reinforcement troops to Europe. But Roger was held back and honorably discharged on February 1, 1945, just days before major offensives left more than 5,000 Canadians either dead or wounded. The reason given for discharge states to return to civil life, to engage in work of national importance. Another section of the discharge interview form states, Morneau is a slender, well-built individual. He is a bilingual 19 years old lad whose conversation indicates a good native ability and maturity beyond his years. Upon discharge, he is returning to the merchant marine. These crew lists confirm that Roger did return to the Merchant Navy where he served until late in 1945. Psalms 37 verses 10 and 20 reads, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. So he came the next night, Tuesday night, four more Bible studies. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The demons had told the priests that he was studying with Adventists. And they called, called our names, Cynthia and Cyril. Fortunately, we didn't know that at that time. Today's topic is Christ, our high priest. We're gonna read now 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Roger, are you okay? I'm lost. Roger, you're not lost. You wouldn't be here studying with us if you were. In the book of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says that all manner of sin shall be forgiven. How to talk to Satan. I don't want this book in my house. You, you have no idea where I've been. Roger, it doesn't matter where you've been. God knows you were deceived. Roger, listen to this. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, likewise, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This book says that only God could die in your place, and Jesus is God, and it's a mystery that God became a man. He went to the electric chair so that you could get off death row. He's alive now, and he wants to be your best friend. Now the choice is up to you.
to me, I just felt if the Lord has brought us this far, he will continue. The spirits have been trying to get in contact with me. They harass me at night. Spirits? Those aren't spirits. They're union workers. I know just how to handle those type of people. Let's go. I still was not a believer in the devil. I went to his house, and he lived at the end of a long hall. Look at that. It's just like George's Lincoln from any point of view. I mean, that thing looks amazing. Just the red seats, green car. I mean, That's I don't know you deliver milk. Which one can you afford, though? <laughs> <laughs> What time do these union people get here? You call them union people. They come at midnight. and there was nothing that I could see there. I told you, it's not union workers. It's okay, sit down, sit down, it's fine. I was afraid and I sat down in the chair and Roger said, don't worry, as long as I don't talk to them, they cannot communicate with me. I didn't think it was gonna happen like this. He said, don't be nervous. A knock came to his balcony door and it was so strong that it almost knocked the wall down. I'm doing two things, man. I'm getting rid of this gun, and I'm gonna get baptized this Sabbath. I gotta go. Have a good night. For Amanda, typing the full manuscript of Roger's autobiography wasn't just another job. Though she loved the Bible since childhood, her grandmother was a practicing witch, and Amanda herself had seen and heard supernatural entities. There was a lot of demon activity, specifically through dreams, is when I was first introduced to one that called itself obsession. It was more of a form of lust, that it was trying to impress itself upon me in the form of love. There's ways that the Lord has shown his love to me specifically, um, called me his, called me beloved, some sweet things that were very dear to me as a child that I held close. But then this spirit entity, this demon obsession would also mimic the exact same words that the Lord would use. It wasn't until probably my teen years that I started to recognize what the different voices were. Since she loved to read and write, Amanda began to pray through journaling. As I've searched for truth um, and the Lord has guided me, I have used my journals just to pour my heart out to Him and ask many questions. And when I learn something new and realize that it's an answer to a question that I've had, He totally like pokes my heart and is like, go get an old journal. And I will, I'll go get them. And it'll like, it'll happen. Like I'll find the page or the question that I had asked. So then I'll write in my current journal like, yay, you answered it from back. 10 years ago. His story is just so amazing, but it spoke right to me. I was like, Lord, I knew I was gonna like this book. And the fact that he was answering a lot of questions, specific questions that I had journaled about. Shortly before meeting Roger, Cyril took Bible studies from the Adventist pastor. He enjoyed everything he studied until the roadblock. I kept on thinking to myself, they're going to church on the wrong day. I said, Elder Taylor, Sunday is the Sabbath. So he brought out a book, and it was a catechism. And in the catechism, he read where the Catholic Church admits that they were the ones who changed the Sabbath from Sabbath to Sunday. Then he brought out a dictionary. 
Saturday was the seventh day of the week. According to the Bible, the seventh day was the only day the Creator blessed and made holy, because in it He rested from all His work which He had created, not as one weary, but out of desire to fellowship with His creation. <laughs> Hardly down to the case. I must stay in your house today. The weekly Sabbath was kept long before there ever was a Jew. That's why the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Jesus kept the seventh day Sabbath and directed his last day people to pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. And I said a silent prayer. Didn't tell my wife, didn't tell Ella Taylor. And I said, Lord, if you want me to keep Saturday for my Sabbath, let me convince one person that Saturday is the Sabbath. And I'll, be, I'll believe. That very week, Cyril left his job and got hired at the new factory with less work and higher pay. Since most of Montreal's garment factories were owned by Jews, the exchange between Cyril and his new boss was not surprising. Then he said, and if you want to make more money still, you can work Saturday and Sunday. I wasn't sure, but I didn't want to take a chance. I said, all right, but I don't work on the Sabbath. He said, you don't have to work on Sunday. I said, uh, no, Saturday is the Sabbath. He was a Jew, so he said to me, are you a Jew? I said, no, I'm a Christian. On the following Monday, Roger found himself sitting next to the new worker to find out more for his curious boss. Two weeks before we hired Amanda to type Roger's autobiography, she was journaling about the Bible Sabbath. I was just like, Lord, I know that Jesus came to complete the law, but he didn't do away with anything. So are we still to be keeping the Sabbath? How come nobody teaches on this? Why is this totally dead in the churches? So in my journal, I had asked the Lord and I just said, please show me what, what it means to you and, and I'll go from there. When I had saw that it started talking about the Sabbath, the Lord pricked my heart again and he was like, here's your answer, you know? I was maybe halfway through the manuscript and was observing my first Sabbath. The next day, she sent us an email describing the day's events. After that, we proceeded to my best friend Carrie's house. We've become best friends through the years, so we spend a lot of time together. It was there that I had told her about Roger's story and what I had been doing and what I had learned so far. And that she was typing the manuscript. As we were talking, the living room lights start flickering. Then her kitchen stove started arcing, like sparking and making a bunch of noise. And she's like, girl, my stove doesn't work. I was having issues with it, so I had unplugged it. And so we ran over there to double check. And sure enough, it was unplugged. And it's still arcing. What is happening? This is crazy. This is a crazy day. But Amanda's day wasn't over yet. On the way home, her leg muscles cramped up, and old heart palpitations were seizing her again. Later, she saw shadow people, dark apparitions with human shape, standing along the road. While there is spiritual activity in my life, it has not been so compounded like that It was as it was on that day. So that's when I was able to see that, wow, there's power in Roger's story. There's something that doesn't want me to continue typing this. And so that's when I even more committed myself, like, I'm going to finish this and I'm going to see how it ends.
on the first Saturday during the week of Bible studies, Roger went to church with Cyril and Cynthia. Cyril was baptized and became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That night, they covered four more Bible studies, including one unhealthy living. Roger hadn't smoked all afternoon, and with a headache, he was dying for a smoke. So I said, Roger, if you're dying for a smoke, if you had to smoke, go ahead and smoke. But he asked, hey, how come you never said anything about smoke? I said, Roger, if I had said anything about your smoking, you would have stopped coming for the Bible studies. So he thought for a moment, he said, you know, you're right. The smoke was, <laughs> you could cut it with a knife with so much smoke. And then I noticed that I didn't go through the, the allergy thing at all. I decided to go through with it and the Lord take care of it. And he took care of it. Roger was addicted and he knew it. Through the Bible studies, he learned that Jesus specializes in hopeless cases. Later that night, he opened his new Bible and read from Matthew 27 about the blood Jesus shed on the cross. He remembered the text, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. He never touched a cigarette again. Roger saw that his new master was far greater than the one he'd been serving. He also saw that the Bible doesn't guess the future, it knows. But Lucifer can only manipulate outcomes wherever he controls people to make it appear that he knows the future. Lucifer loves the cartoonish caricature of Satan. It helps to discredit the Bible as a bunch of fairy tales. That way, he can play both sides and get away with it. He can bring catastrophe, war, disease, and famine, then ride in as the hero, manifesting as an angel of light, an alien, or a departed loved one, supposedly alive in another realm. He can be the yin and yang, the black and white magic, Satan and Jesus. He and his followers even quote the Bible, such as, I said you are gods, but they leave out the rest, and all of you are children of the Most High. This Hebrew name of God, Most High, is Elyon, which means highest among like things. In other words, humans are godlike if they're like the God who became one of us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Child, arise. Now Roger understood why the fallen angels wouldn't say Jesus' name and would refer to him only as the Creator. For the demons also believe and tremble. Though the great master Lucifer claimed to be a life giver, this was no more true than the belief that humans have immortal souls. The Hebrew word in the Bible for soul is nefesh, which means person, not a conscious entity that goes somewhere in the afterlife. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So you see, Roger, a soul is a person. It can die. Through the Bible studies, Roger learned that God alone is immortal, that the dead are really dead, that immortality will be given to God's friends at the second coming of Jesus.
and that someday evil will be destroyed and forever cease to exist. And he would repeat the paragraph or the sentence or the scripture and it, he could pick up things like that. And I think that's what it was. He, he was searching and he found what he was looking for. Well, yeah, that's what prayer was, certainly yeah. answered. So in a few days I met you and uh, read Bible studies, 20 Bible studies in one week, and I decided to give the Bible Sabbath first Saturday. A few months later I was baptized in the Amendment Keeping Church. Cyril reflects on the change in Roger. Something made me take my cheap camera and take a picture of Roger. He looked evil. When Roger tried, he called it animal magnetism, to take his hands and put it against my back and move back his hands and I'm supposed to fall back. I had no knowledge of what he was doing. He wanted to see if the power that he was fooling with was more powerful than the power that mm -hmm. I was coming from. It was the Holy Spirit between us that stopped anything that he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And less than a year later, we took a picture of him with his new wife and he looked like an angel. He looked so different. By the 1970s, Cyril and Cynthia were teachers and owned a private school in California. In New York State, Roger became a salesman and regional manager for the Yellow Pages. After 30 years since being together in Montreal, the couples reconnected for a weekend in Toronto. Cyril and Cynthia had one purpose in mind. Roger, you had an experience that many people have never had. We want you to write the book about your story. He said, man, I'm, I'm French. I, I can't write in, in English. I said, Roger, you write any way you want to. Send it to us and we'll check it over. We'll make the corrections. And you just keep on sending the pages till it's finished. He said, yeah, but who's going to type it? I said, we have a little business, we'll have our typist type it. Hi, Cyril, my old friend. Since we met together in Toronto, Hilda and I are often reminiscing about that wonderful weekend. Enclosed are eight more pages for you to add to the manuscript. Well, we were amazed at how his writing was so almost perfect. In fact, it looked like his writing was made by a machine. And it took about a year, and I mailed the original back to Roger, but I kept a copy in case it was lost in the mail. The book was published in 1982 and included only half of Roger's original manuscript. My father never said anything to me until I was 30 years of age. And at that time, he had already written most of the book, and my father told my husband and I then that there was something he had to share with us and it was at that point in time that he told us about his past and I had asked him why we never knew about it sooner and he said it's because he did not want the children growing up in fear. You think about it, it took 30 years for him to come out and write the book. He wasn't thinking about money. He was not, he was not proud of it. He was not proud of being a fallen angel worshiper. Even at that time, he was still being harassed, being followed. He said that he would be walking down the road and they would materialize normally on the opposite side of the road because he'd see them in the background and then they'd be gone. So he knew that they were evil spirits. I know that they open up and slam the garage door. They kicked his dog. He was harassed in certain ways until the day he died. Roger said to me, Pastor, let's take a walk. And as we came to an area where there was a dumpster, little Crystal suddenly stopped. <coughs> the dog saw the devil. <coughs> I couldn't see anything there. <coughs> The first time they walked by there, the devil actually kicked the dog. It just shook me up that here was a, an individual who was 
having real experiences with the devil, wanting to serve the Lord, and yet being threatened by the devil. That doesn't happen very often. And I'll never forget the moment he said to me, I have never started a day without God since I took those Bible studies. If I had, Satan would have destroyed me. In 1990, Roger's book, Incredible Answers to Prayer, was published. It just thrilled him to get these prayer requests from people all over the world. Not only via mail, but email, fax, and phone. And he would pray over them one at a time when they first came in, and then he would put them in the tower, and they were on his prayer list. He never disclosed the people's names, but he would ask us to pray because God knows who the people are. Whenever I walked into that bedroom and saw those prayer towers, that was sacred ground. There were thousands of those requests, and there were thousands of answers. That's where he would get his material for his books. <laughs> <laughs> Gandhi was the life of the party. His life goals were a big house, fancy car, and living for the weekends. But the fast life wasn't fun anymore. Sure, you're hanging out with friends, but then when you wake up in the morning, you felt horrible. It just got worse and worse. I thought, oh, maybe if I made more money, or oh, maybe if I changed jobs, or oh, maybe if I dated this other girl or, or something, it would fill that void, and, it, and, and none of that made, it, made any difference. And in the end, it was always, that void was the only thing left. That emptiness was still there. The anger was there, frustration was there. And I didn't see any way out. I got on my knees poured my heart out to God. I don't know what's going on here in my life. It feels like everything's being turned completely upside down. And you said that if you seek, you shall find. And I almost, like I challenged God to show me, to truly show me that he really was a keeper of his word. Later, at a bookstore, he noticed one on answers to prayer. And it talked about this guy being in the ICU. And I started reading, and I thought, oh, I mean, we're working in a hospital, I can relate to this. And it was very interesting, and I couldn't put the book down. The author's name was Roger Morneau, and I'd never heard of the man before. He talks about all these miracles and, and these answers to prayer. Dondi wondered if the author could help him. I ended up calling the publisher do you have a phone number or some kind of contact information for this author? They had an address listed under an R Morneau, and that was really all they had. At first, he thought he would write a letter. Then he recalled he had a full tank of gas and didn't have to work for several more days. Drive time from Loma Linda to Modesto would be about seven hours. As I'm shooting up the freeway and heading towards LA and heading up towards Modesto, I, I remember thinking, what am I doing? But yet I was desperate, longing for some kind of direction and hope. I wanted to know what he knew and why his prayers were so powerful. When I walked up to Roger's door, I was like, what if this is the wrong place? Would he turn me away? Would he be too busy to see me or talk to me? Or I said, you know, I'm sorry for just showing up like this, but does the author of this book live here? And so Roger and Hilda invited me in, and for the next five hours, we studied the Bible. We talked about prayer life. We talked about his experiences and what God has done for him. Every morning he woke up, he read Matthew 27, 24 to 54, the power chapter in the Bible, as he called it. 
and that he, when he prayed for people, he asked for forgiveness first, and that he thanked God for appropriating to him that day the merits of the precious sacred blood shed on Calvary. Then he would follow by the intercessional prayer for people. When I was there, I saw he had all these letters on his table from people all over the world. He says, I realized that how, how truly little faith there was out there. Uh, there was a lady he mentioned that called him weekly from Australia. He told her, he says, you know what? I will carry you to the foot of the cross every day and I'll put you on my prayer list. But that's what he did, you know? He was an amazing prayer warrior. Dondi was curious to look inside Roger's Bible. And so I picked it up and I turned it to that chapter of Matthew that he talks about. And I mean, he had to laminate the pages just to keep them intact. I felt very in awe to hold that and then to see that and to verify that all the things that he talks about in his, in his books, yeah, that, that's real. He told me he would put me on his prayer list. And when I left his place, I was convicted that everything was going to be okay. It was that beginning of filling that void. In Roger's third book on prayer, he mentions Dondi's first visit. And yeah, sure enough, I was like, wow, I felt very honored. Roger was inspired by the Lord. Yeah. Directly. Mm -hmm. When his copy machine stopped working because it ran out of ink, he had no money to buy more ink. And he mm -hmm. prayed and asked the Lord to help him until he had more money. And the machine started working and it worked. Two, I think, two years. Almost two years yeah. with no ink. And I saw operated many, many times with no toner. He would take the cartridge out, he would shake it, he would show us that there was no toner in the cartridge. He called me in to study and I saw the printer and he fed a piece of paper in there and it printed out a beautiful copy of this story of this miracle printer that continues to print without ink. And I think at that time it was like 3,000 pages had gone through that printer uh, at the time of my, the printing that he gave me. I still have that print today. Carol had read Roger's three books on answers to prayer and wanted to have her name added to his prayer list, especially now. It was Carol's second heart attack in the last four days. Her blood pressure was sky high. Medical tests revealed blockage in one of her heart's arteries and the doctors didn't know why. Carol is young. Uh, she eats I, well. I never, she don't smoke. I never use drug, no alcohol, and we were total vegetarian. Is there anything I can do for you? Can you fax Mr. Renault a per request for me? I'm contacting you at the insistence of my wife, Carol Michelle. She's been sick for some time now, and there's no precise diagnosis. She's in the ICU after having a second heart attack. I'm worried for her life. Mr. Monot, can you pray for her? You can reach her, if you wish, to this phone number at the hospital, Hotel Dieu. The doctors tried to stabilize her blood pressure for hours, and none of the medications were working. Each day, the heart pumps 3,000 gallons of blood throughout the body, and it gets its own supply from the coronary arteries. A heart attack occurs when one of those arteries becomes narrow or blocked. The narrowing is usually due to a lifestyle-related disease called 
atherosclerosis. But this was not Carol's problem, and the doctors were perplexed. Medical tests showed that the middle portion of the left anterior descending artery, or the LAD, was 75% blocked. The LAD is considered the most crucial because it supplies blood to over half of the heart muscle. A major blockage of the LAD can kill more of the heart muscle and can even cause sudden death. Less than two hours after Jean sent the fax, Roger called the hospital. Then he started to speak to me in French. So I said, yes, how is your wife? I said, my wife, my friend is crisis right now, crisis. So he said to me, okay, he said, I want to talk to her. I said, Mr. Morneau, you, you, you will not be. He said, Jean, I want to talk to her. So I said to the nurse, this man is connected with the guy above and you want to talk to her and pray for her. The nurse stared in shock at the request, and yet for some reason, finally agreed. Said, Mr. Hold on, put on hold. I said, Mr. Manu, I put the phone on her ear, you, you can talk now. He said to me, I want to pray with you. I said, did you finish? Because I don't know what's going on. Did you finish? <laughs> and the nurse are there looking at me. <laughs> Within minutes, after Roger prayed with Carol, her blood pressure dropped to normal. She was discharged from the hospital soon after. Several weeks later, Carol had a third and much worse heart attack. Extent of damage is greater, and they still don't know why. According to the doctors, the only way to know is to open and see. Please continue to pray for Carol. Medical tests revealed up to 90% blockage in the middle and proximal segments of the LAD. A blockage in the proximal area increases risk of sudden death, also known as the Widowmaker. Since Carol had multiple areas of blockage and evidence of dissection, that is, tears in the artery wall, the doctors recommended open heart bypass surgery. He said to me, you have something bizarre. It was a problem, but when I open, I don't see anything. So the guy opened, he see nothing, and they made the bypass. Post-op medical tests revealed that the blockages in the proximal and middle sections of the LAD had totally disappeared. This means that the blood was flowing through Carol's heart as if she had not had a bypass. Carol's cardiologist, Dr. Janess, stated, the results are extraordinary. The lesions have somehow disappeared. I remain perplexed about the origin of this illness. Now, more than 20 years later, Carol still meets with Dr. Janess for an annual checkup, even though she's had no more chest pain or heart attacks. He told me, your bypass is still there, but your blood that doesn't go through that bypass. Yes. During Carol's 1996 health crisis, Jean sent a total of 14 faxes to Roger. He called us very often. A very often. Friday night. He called us to say, how goes Carol? And it's funny because I, I'm there and the phone rang and I sent in the phone. Oh, Mr. Marnou! I just want to say thank you to God. I don't know if I will be here today if I didn't meet Roger Marno. Roger Marno existed. I talked to him and I wrote and he wrote back. And he prayed and Carol was healed. 
praying that the great power that raised up Lazarus from the dead be made to permeate every cell of your body, causing the elements of death to disintegrate and pass out of your being. If he really meant what he said there, and if he is really connected with the source of life, and if the source of life agreed with his request, that explained her, her healing. That there are maybe sometimes things that happen that cannot be explained by this physical world. My grandfather's experience and his testimonies, it has had a profound effect on my life. I was exposed to spiritual realities at a young age, and they weren't just stories to me. I believed them as a child as factual. He did talk about his love for his parents and people. My grandfather was never anti-Catholic. He's anti-deception of what Satan and the angels have deceived humanity with. That's what he was. They were still instrumental in instructing my grandfather. They did to the best of their ability. I said, yeah, I'm really excited to meet them. And it's not a Catholic thing. I was as sure as I was sure that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, that the spirits were going to do me in at night. I probably have heard his conversion story at least a hundred times or more than that. Over and over again, you just don't lose out on the dramatic scene that's there. And it really never varied from the first to the last time I heard it, other than just a few little details here and there. I mean, it was always consistent. For me, there's no question about whether it was truth or not, because you don't have to remember the truth. You have to remember a lie. What a great privilege it was, not only as his friend, but as his pastor. We had this very close relationship. What he said, I could trust. You could go to Roger with almost anything, couldn't you, Sherman, and share your challenges in the ministry. And it's very, very difficult for a pastor to lose a prayer partner. We don't judge people, but we can judge the fruit of their life. And I knew Roger and Hilda well. I was in their home. I spent many hours talking with them. If I didn't know the man, you, you would almost think that whoever conjured up an experience like this would have to be a, um, a, a psychopathic liar. But I knew the, the family, and he was absolutely sincere, and he lived it. And your ministry as a writer really began when you were 57 years of age. Right. Uh, you didn't have any idea. I knew when we went into that interview yeah. that it could be his last because he was suffering from congestive heart failure. He was a real trooper. I think he, he became more energized by the process. So it was a real blessing. It was a privilege for me to sit there and be part of that. I shook hands with them and said, well, if I'm still alive, I'll be here tomorrow night for Bible study number 489. See, we had 28 Bible studies in one week, seven days. So, so what happened here? I'm getting ideas for a new evangelistic series. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what happened here is that... Uh, Shortly after his TV interview, Roger confided in Dondi. Roger got so many phone calls that he put a block on his phone so that if, unless you knew a certain code, you couldn't really get to him. The week before his interview, Roger received an anonymous call that bypassed all the phone security. And the stranger said, Years ago, you were part of an elite society of Satan worshipers. He says a price was put on your head and you were to be shot by somebody within our society. And at this event is where it will take place at Doug Batchelor's church. Then Roger spoke. The moment a bullet touches me, the Creator will take the very breath of life out of you. And he said to me that if any attempt ever was made, we really never knew. The Apostle Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness. darkness. In God's great mercy, 
he laid Roger to rest. He doesn't have to fight that battle anymore. On September 22, 1998, Roger died from a brain aneurysm. He was 73. So all those prayers that Roger prayed for people, because it used to kind of worry me, what's going to happen to all those? Roger's prayers are still going around the throne of God. Without Cynthia and Cyril, and I love you, Cynthia and Cyril, my grandparents wouldn't be married. My mom wouldn't be. I wouldn't be and my precious daughter. All eternity would be changed. You know, Cyril could have said no. Cynthia said, no way am I going to have a cigarette smoking, cigar smoking, cussing man in my house. It would have been finito. And then who knows what lies my grandfather would have destroyed. The great master wasn't going to initiate my grandfather into that society to be a good man for this planet. It was to destroy people. You were uh, responsible for helping me to become a stronger person while I was responsible for helping you to see the difference between what you believed at that time and the right. truth. So it looks like God has a wonderful, mysterious way of working with men. Right. It's a long battle. We have a lot of memories. That's half of them. <laughs> <laughs>